Yeah, if you want to get us started. Okay. First off, welcome. Uh, this is an exciting opportunity to use the technology that's out there to really gauge and engage a wider community. Um, so what I'm charged to do is give you a broad overview of the water management plan and context through which we were optimizing rural best practices, if you will, on the, the landscape in our watershed. And we were using advanced GIS tools to do so. We're really excited about this approach. I think we've, we've been able to, uh, to pilot um, some very unique technology and, uh, and we're hopeful that our CA community and resource management community can all share and learn and we can learn from one another. So what I'm going to give you is just a broad overview of the, the water management plan for the grant. Someone just asked me who I was, so I'm going to introduce myself, <laughs> so I apologize. It's Sandra Cook. I'm the Senior Water Quality Supervisor with the Grand River Conservation Authority. Great. So onward. So the, the plan for the grant. We have been undertaking a plan uh, to update the water management plan here at the Grand River, water, uh, Grand River Conservation Authority over the last five years. We have a long history of water management. Um, dating back over 80 years now. Um, we've always had a plan to manage water on a watershed basis, um, dating back obviously to 1932. The last formal plan was in 1982, and in 2009 we undertook an update to that plan, um, and it's culminating now in um, a wide variety of, of uh, outcomes and integrated actions that I'll just highlight briefly. This is not a GRCA plan. It is actually a collaborative process that we've undertaken over the last five years to engage all of our partners. Water is a shared resource in, uh, in Ontario, so we have a, stat, or a uh, project team and steering committee that comprise our member municipalities of our watershed, First Nations, as well as three government ministries. OMAF, MOE, and MNR, as well as Environment Canada and Ag Canada, all sitting on our, on our working groups, steering committee, and project team. We were building the water management plan update based on existing data and knowledge, and maybe reconfiguring some of the, the tools that we have, and that's a great, ex uh, and today is a great example of that. Well, our goal is to find best value solutions to effectively manage water in the watershed. The management plan identifies three critical issues, certainly climate change, population growth, and extensive agriculture. The Grand River has about 70% of its land base is actively farmed, and it certainly contributes to some of the challenges that we have uh, in the watershed. The goals are fourfold. We have one, to ensure sustainable water supplies for communities, economies, and ecosystems. The second is to improve water quality to improve river health and reduce the river's impact on Lake Erie. Our, another one is to reduce flood damage potential as well as to increase the resiliency to deal with climate change. Focusing in on the second goal to improve water quality to improve river health and reduce the river's impact on Lake Erie, we really looked at where the sources are for nitrogen and phosphorus. That's the primary issues of water quality in the watershed. No doubt about it, during the summer, point sources are dominating the, the water quality issues with most of the load coming in from point, source, point sources through the watershed. Having said that though, during the spring, after significant rainfall, the tendency is most, if not all, of the nitrogen and phosphorus is coming from non-point sources. About 94% on a regional basis is coming in from non-point sources, and your point sources really offer a small contribution during the spring. What we also did as part of the water management plan is try to identify, well, where are those um, large loads of phosphorus and nitrogen coming from? And this slide just illustrates generally the priority watersheds with respect to phosphorus. We looked at relative loads across the, the, the watershed and looked at our major basins. And basically, relatively, we're looking at the Nith River, 
Fairchild's Creek, Canigajig Creek, and Conestoga River as those priority subwatersheds that we really need to look at reducing phosphorus loads from. With that background in information, it really is feeding into our integrated action plan. And I'm just giving you a very brief overview of, of what the plan looks like. But in essence, part of the action plan is to identify best practices and best approaches to reduce, or re reduce the phosphorus or nitrogen loads or um, improve water quality. So in the action plan, it specifically starts to talk about implementing best practices in priority watersheds, amongst many other actions. One of which, as I just mentioned, we really need to expand on the Rural Water Quality Program and get more effective and efficient with that. It's a fabulous program, 15 years invested in developing some great on-the-ground relationships with farmers, and we need, we need to do more of that. So the Water Management Plan acknowledges that. We also need to acknowledge the need to look at BMPs on rural non-farm properties as well, as well as consider looking at farming practices in addition to existing structural BMPs like manure storages. But lastly, it's highlighting the need to look at critical source areas or nutrient source areas or identifying where the variable source areas are. It's all the same type of terminology at trying to identify where on the landscape we should be looking at putting BMPs in order to get sort of the best bang for your buck or best value solution. And because of this approach, we tried an approach to look at using the high resolution DEM in which my colleagues Jill and Anne will be describing in their longer presentation, but really using this type of information coupled with some spatial analysis and terrain analysis to see if we can tease out where on the landscape we can see where the, the, the phosphorus and nitrogen might be coming from. So we developed a, a staff team, but also an interagency team to come together and advise us on how we, we would approach that. We recently just released a report called Sources of Nutrients and Sediments in the Grand River Watershed. That allows us to look at the conceptual understanding of nutrient processes and transport from nutrient contributing areas to the, to the grand. So that's a, a report that will be out on our website shortly. But that was sort of the first starting block, and that's where we identified the NIF as being a, a priority sub-watershed. Working with our geomatics team, they were updating the hydrology layer using 3D delineation methods, and Jill will get into that approach shortly. And then developing hydrologically conditioned high-resolution DEM for routing surface water flow through the pilot watershed areas. This is a map of the upper NIF, and what we're going to be doing is identifying and profiling our approach on a small subshed in the upper NIF called Ferella Creek. And with that, I will pass it over to Jill, who will be going through a lot of the GIS technologies and approach that she's used. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Um, so I'm Jill Marshall. I'm the GIS photogrammetry analyst at the GRCA. And um, as mentioned by Sandra, Ann and I are going to share with you today our project on using advanced GIS technologies for targeting agricultural best management practices. So our project had two main objectives. The first objective was to demonstrate how a high-resolution digital elevation model and advanced GIS te techniques can be used to determine nutrient source areas. And the second objective was to demonstrate how the identified nutrient source areas can be used to target agricultural best management practices. So Sandra already mentioned some of this, but for our uh, pilot study area, the upper NIF was chosen because it was identified as a significant contributor of nutrients and sediment in the water management plan. And then due to um, processing time of data and data availability, we further um, defined our study area to Ferella Creek, which is approximately 32 kilometers squared. And of course, it's located in the upper NIF subbasin. The 
first stage of our pilot project was to generate a high-resolution DEM. And in order to do this, we needed to set up um, a stereo project using the um, soft copy software and the Swoop 2010 aerial data. The Swoop 2010 aerial data includes the scans, the camera files, the orientation files, and the control files. And when used together in a soft copy system, we're able to capture 3D hydrology and um, 3D point collections. This uh, image on the screen is of one of our 3D setups at the GRCA. Uh, once the stereo data is all ready um, and working, the first piece of data that needs to be captured is the large-scale 3D vector hydrology. Um, this is captured using the um, overlapped images and in a polygons and points for attaching an X, a Y, and a Z value to each vertex. The second piece of data that needed to be created was the pixel autocorrelation point collection, which I'll refer to as PAC. PAC is a multi-image matching technique um, that results in approximately a point every 47 centimeters, and that results in approximately, um, or, or quite a few, over 100 million points per five kilometer squared study area. So lots and lots of data we're collecting. Once the pack point collection was generated, we, we need to classify the data and clean it up a little bit. So we want to classify it to remove all points that are not identified as surface points. So, um, so here you can see the canopy cover um, and the high points in the, the pack point collection. We remove those. Again, you can see across the surface hydrology, points are, are a little bit bumpy, so we also remove those. The other reason why we remove the points over surface hydrology is because we want to enforce the digitized hydrology into our raster. And then we also get artifacts that we want to remove. These are points along um, hydro line, and so those, those high points also need to be removed from the data set. Once the pack point collection is all cleaned up, we convert it to a multi-part feature in ArcGIS and create a terrain data set. A terrain data set is very useful for this project because it is able to handle millions and millions of points. And it also uses surface feature types, which allow us to enforce the polygon and line surface hydrology features into the, the final raster data set. So once we create our terrain, we convert it to a raster, and we're, uh, we have our final Frella Creek DEM, one meter cell size spacing, and with hydrology enforced. So once our raster is created, we can start identifying nutrient source areas using two soil analysis approaches. The first is the terrain analysis approach, which we use to identify potential areas of gully erosion. And the second is the Russell FACT approach. Russell, Russell FACT stands for the Revised Universal Soil Loss Equation for Application in Canada. And this approach um, we use to identify locations of potential sh um, sheet erosion. And it was our goal to use the identified priority areas from both of these models um, to prioritize best management practices by our resource and conservation staff. So the first approach is the train analysis approach. And this approach only uses one input layer, and that's our digital, digital elevation model. The di digital elevation model is used then to calculate a slope raster and a flow accumulation raster, and those together are used to calculate the stream power index raster. The stream power index um, identifies areas of potential gully erosion and areas of sheet erosion to the gullies. Here's a sample of our stream power index raster, where the high SPI values represents a likely overland flow path on the surface during a storm event, and these are the gully locations. So to further understand the, the SPI values, we calculated percentiles. And the 75th to 95th percentile values were calculated in an attempt to identify paths of cells with high stream power index values that flow into surface hydrology. And these paths are called stream power index signatures. And for the Frella Creek project, the 95th percentile value of 2.214 identified these paths nicely. And you can see that on the raster, um, in the raster there. You can see the paths of red raster cells that are connecting to the blue line, which is the surface hydrology. And those are the potential locations of gullies. So we had to further confirm this. Um, so Anne Fleffler from the GRCA, who's presenting with me today, and Dave Bray from OMAFRA, went out into the field um, to verify these, these percentiles. And they found that 9 out of 10 of the gully locations that were identified with the raster were true um, gullies out in the field. Only one was not identifiable, and that was uh, probably because um, of the vegetation. There was very thick vegetation um, at the end of August when they went out. So um, 
So that, that potentially could be the reason. So once field verified, we were confident with the 95th percentile SPI value of 2.214. So we defined our stream power index signatures and further our stream power index signature catchment areas. Um, and these catchments um, were used to identify priority areas. And these are the areas likely to convey nutrients to surface water. And here is a small um, sample of these catchments. We categorized them into high, medium, and low classes. So high um, is the dark brown and low is um, the yellowy beige color, which, which might be hard to see. Um, so once, once we calculate our priority areas, we further wanted to understand the average annual soil loss potential in our study area. And we did this using um, the Russell fact. So uh, the Russell fact is a, um, just a calculation using six different factors um, of multiplying rasters together. So the first factor is the R factor and it's for rainfall. And to generate this raster, we were provided with 45 climate stations in and around the Grand, Grand River watershed. And we created a DEM using the spline and turbulation tool, and then we cut it back to our Ferella Creek study area. The next factor is the K factor, which is soil erodibility. Um, and to generate this raster, we extracted soils from the 1 to 20,000 uh, region of Waterloo soils data and assigned a K value um, to the different soil types. And these K values were provided to us from OMAFRA. The next two factors, the L and the S factor, are typically assigned together as one LS slope length and steepness factor. Traditionally, um, Russell uses the hill slope length factor approach to determine the LS values. But for this pilot, we really wanted to focus and demonstrate the use of our high resolution DEM. So we focused on the concept of upslope contributing area in order to incorporate the impact of flow convergence. And this is um, suggested, or through our research, we found that this better reflects the impact of concentrated flow on um, increased erosion. And the inputs for this raster were the slope and the flow accumulation that I spoke about earlier. The fifth factor is the crop management factor, the C factor. And for, um, to generate this raster, we used two management types. We used a value of one for agricultural lands and 0.03 for permanent natural color, cover, so wood lots or um, natural areas. And the last factor is the P factor, which is support practice. And uh, due to the limited spatial data on this factor, we assigned a value of one for the whole study area. So once we had all of our six factors um, created, we multiplied them together in ArcGIS to create one final raster output. Um, again, we classified it into high, medium, and low. So high is the dark brown areas, and low is the, the lighter brown areas. Um, and that's our final Russell output. And for this project, we wanted to focus on just the high areas. So we focused on the high catchments, the high SPI catchments, the high values of the Russell fact. And together, those were used to identify priority areas in Ferella Creek. And um, again, it was our goal for these outputs to be used by our resource and conservation staff to target agricultural best management practices. And I'll now pass it over to Anne, who will talk more about that. Thank you, Joe. Okay, this is Anne Leffler. I'm a conservation specialist with GRCA, and it's my job to turn this information into language that I can understand and the farmers I'm trying to talk to can understand. So um, the farm you see in this photo is in the Ferella Creek watershed. It's in one of the highest elevation areas of the watershed. It's farmed by Mr. Martin. Uh, I'm going to be referring back to this farm during the presentation. Uh, I've known Mr. Martin for about 16 years, and we've worked with him on other projects, and he, it turns out he was a high priority in this uh, study as well. So we want to use this mapping process to help us find the best value solutions for addressing the sediment and nutrient issues we have in the river. Uh, we want to tease out the differences between the erosion, sheet erosion and gully erosion. Uh, we want to look at where these issues are coming from and then target the BMP accordingly. Uh, we want to identify the most vulnerable farms um, and then maybe have that option of offering higher incentives to the most critical farms so that we uh, get an improved chance that they might adopt those BMPs. Um, we envision that the mapping techniques here will provide us with some really 
interesting new communications tools. I certainly had some great conversations with some of the local farmers once I had this. And perhaps in the future, this technique can help us in our phosphorus accounting efforts as we try to estimate the kilograms of phosphorus kept on the land through the implementation of BMPs. So uh, Jill's maps are helping us identify the areas of higher risk. Um, so this kind of map here, the risk of gully erosion, would become our number one scoping tool to help identify farms that would benefit from the installation of erosion control structures, such as water and sediment control basins. Uh, Mr. Martin's farm is located close to one of the highest points in the watershed. Um, where this, this is Mr. Martin's farm. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this map here compares the risk of sheet erosion as opposed to gully erosion. And it highlights those areas that would benefit most from conservation practices. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't know where that came from. That would uh, benefit the most from conservation practices such as cover crops. So here we've combined the Stream Power Index and the Russell. And uh, so this map shows us our primary target areas in the Ferala Creek watershed. So let's take it down to the farm scale. This is something that I might show to a farmer or leave with him. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, it shows that the majority, this is the purple lines here, the property lines, and it shows that the majority of Mr. Martin's farm is at a high risk for gully erosion. And it doesn't even look, at, look like that on f at first glance when you look at the place. So that's been a very interesting exercise. Um, next. Uh, this is the first map that Jill actually produced uh, that I showed to Mr. Martin, and this was the uh, 95th percentile stream power index. I showed this to him because I wanted some verification that our process was working. Uh, and he was really impressed by this. He um, spent a lot of time looking at it. He said he couldn't find any fault at all with the results. He thought that our process had identified the potential gullies quite well. So um, I'm, the next photo I'm going to show you, I took from about here on the road. Oh, sorry, from from uh, from the side road, looking southwest towards the farm buildings. So, oh, just to go back, you can see the major gully that that goes down towards the buildings, and there it is. Uh, this was during spring runoff on his farm about five years ago. So I'm happy to show you that this lines up beautifully with the maps that. Jill created. <coughs> this map then shows the risk of the gully erosion on Mr. Martin's farm, and it shows me that there is some areas of very high risk of sheet erosion. But the first thing I notice when I look at that map is I would like to work with the neighbor to the east as well encourage some conservation practices there. So what we've been able to do until now, before we had this, uh, these materials, um, we have been offering technical assistance and financial incentives to all farmers in the region of Waterloo who feel they have a soil erosion issue. So we haven't, we haven't targeted it to a specific watershed. We work with those farmers that come forward looking for assistance because it's obvious to them that they have a problem. So if they think they have a problem, we're pretty sure they do. Uh, we offer grants on erosion control structures. Uh, that's 75% up to $10,000, regardless of where they are located in the county. Uh, by the way, we do this in Wellington County as well. Now, what's new for this year is that we have started um, 
offering incentive payments for farmers to establish cover crops on their farms as well, where we are going to be paying $100 per acre for up to 30 acres per applicant to establish cover crops. Um, but I see us using this new mapping on at least four levels. Once we have mapping for all of the sub-watersheds, it would facilitate comparisons between sub-watersheds, and that would help us internally identify priorities and best value solutions. Uh, it could help us do a better job of connecting the specific issue, which would be gully versus sheet erosion, to the appropriate BMPs. And it will help identify critical areas for water sampling. I already know that the maps are going to be great conversation starters with farmers, and I suspect they're going to become a catalyst for farmers taking action. At the program delivery level, um, we have the potential now to build a program to offer incentives for conservation practices in addition to the current projects, uh, structural projects. And we have the ability now to tailor our incentive program levels to improve those chances that, to improve the chances that the targeted farmers will participate. That's not something we're doing currently, but it, it becomes an option that basically if a guy is in a very high priority area, he might get offered a higher, per, a higher um, incentive level. And then we also suspect that once we have generated the contours from this mapping, it will help our soil erosion engineer in the design of the erosion control structures do away with the need to survey in the field and make it a lot easier to design these things in the middle of February. Uh, this is a quick look at the bigger picture. Uh, these maps have, uh, they're a great step forward in identifying priority sites, but we have to remember, of course, this land is privately owned and managed by farmers. The ultimate decision whether or not to implement BMPs is going to rest with them. BMP implementation will be influenced by the strength of the relationship that we as a CA have with the farming community. So that becomes, that, that remains a real priority to, to keep a very strong relationship. We don't want to overwhelm farmers with maps. So I, I think I'd, I'd be very selective about the number of maps I'd take out to uh, when I go out to see someone. We'll continue to need trained and experienced extension staff and individualized site visits, of course, as well as the expertise in designing appropriate erosion control structures. And we need adequate long-term financial incentive programs to invite and maintain farm participation. So I showed the stream power index to three farmers in the Farella Creek watershed, and all of them agreed that the mapping was quite accurate. And they were very amazed at the details, and what made me happy is that they weren't defensive in any way. They were just very, very interested in what it was we could create from, from our desks in Cambridge. Um, Mr. Martin, whose farm I've featured here, actually asked us on the spot to help him design a water and sediment control basin system to address the gully erosion issue. Now, I, I can't show Mr. Martin's picture. He doesn't like having his picture taken. He loves it when I take pictures of his horses. So this is why you're being treated to the team here. Uh, so I'd just like to close the circle on this now by uh, taking this back to the draft implementation action plan and the water management plan that Sandra referred to. Uh, the mapping methodologies we discussed here will help us address two points in the action plan promoting conservation practices in addition to structures and enhancing assistance in priority areas or sub-watersheds. I really look forward to working with this mapping and I think it'll bring the discussion about erosion issues with farmers to a whole new level and I think it will help them understand the, the potential impact of their farms to the water users downstream. Uh, that's all I have to say now. I apologize profusely for the coughing. Um, Jill has a couple more slides and then we'll wrap up. Okay. So one last slide here is um, just some future project considerations. 
Uh, for the project study area, I mentioned that we had to um, scale it back due to processing time and availability. So it's something we're going to look further into. The soil, avail soil data's availability is what we um, were a little bit worried about, but we have to, in the future, maybe do some tests to see if the vintage stuff would be um, acceptable or not. And again, um, we have to see if the processing time can uh, maybe be cut in half or if we start to do things um, by tile basis or something. Uh, the terrain analysis uh, pertains to surface flow only, and it doesn't include tile drainage. The other thing is the 95th percentile stream power index identified for Frella, so the 2.414 value, will need to be recalculated for each study area um, and, it ha and probably field verified or at least local knowledge verified. So there's a little bit of a timely aspect there. And the Russell FAC analysis um, is the average annual approach. So we need to reevaluate the available data and also the classification we put into high, medium, and low. But maybe, um, maybe we need to be a little bit more careful between um, the high and the medium or the medium and low and see if we're, um, like Anne showed, if we're starting to push too many of the highs into the medium or mediums into the low, that type of thing. But, and thank you.